indeed, for the cabinet intervention as well. Uh, you see I get some uh, special treatment. Uh, for special treatment, we have a wonderful word in German, which is called extrawurst, so the special sausage. I hope you can live with this special sausage that I'm standing now here, because I would like to use the beamer for my presentation. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers of this conference, including you, Petra, for inviting me over here to this conference in this beautiful city, and also giving me the opportunity to share my ideas with this distinguished audience of yours. I would also like to thank Professor Rachten, who is now still around, uh, for his various initiatives regarding commemorating the First World War. Well, we've already said so, that half of this presentation is called The Unsurprising Surprise of Total War. Because, well, um, for the days it was, uh, not least for the days perception, it was a surprise that now war was so total. Um, I start with a quote by the German Social Democratic politician August Bebe, who said in the 9th November of 1911, then disaster was struck. The plane all the tomorrow will be given sending to the battlefields 16 to 18 million men to fly of European youth, equipped with the best tools for murder and turn against each other as enemies. Um, the idea that only in the political field, but also in the public field, was that there was a huge war coming on. And uh, he was wrong when it comes to the figures, so it was actually more than 17 million of young men, 17 who were actually being sent to the war. I'll switch over the words as well uh, to give you an early piece of film, 1909, The Airship Destroyer, where our hero actually fell in love with a lady. Uh, he's an inventor, but uh, there's a big chance for him, there's an invasion going on, a huge invasion by airships of an enemy country which is not being named. And this fear of airships. Uh, is something which develops over the early 20th century. There will be a war in the air, there will be new technology. And uh, what we see there next some seconds, but he is trying later on to use his inventions against these for invasion, which doesn't turn out really well. And how they envisage the bombing is being taken place including against uh, anti-aircraft tanks. We're speaking here about 1909. So, this country is I'll start with this. Going back to the perception of World War I. If you ask people now about World War I, it's about trenches, machine guns, gas, bayonets, tanks, planes, U-boats, then I see it as the first total war. Um, let's look at these different kinds of perceptions when it comes to trenches. Uh, yes, there was huge trenches, huge uh, massive uh, systems of trenches, but uh, mainly on the Western Front, also the Eastern Front, but we had huge areas where this whole fighting was being done uh, on a movement way, not in a trench way. And even more so uh, when it comes to other subjects, it wasn't the first time so far. Very successfully, trenches were being employed. Uh, and the Russo Japanese War and also the American Civil War. The picture is here from uh, Petersburg uh, during the American Civil War that also showed a huge advantage for the defender against an attacker. When it comes to machine guns, it's quite interesting when in the past some months I spoke with people who say, oh yeah, first of all, the machine guns have been invented there. So, uh, no, actually not. They were very thoroughly used, but there was previous concepts, like the Gatling gun, also employed in the American Civil War, but hampered in its success. Uh, the photo is not from the Civil War, but from the Boxer Rise in 1900, but the system was pretty much the same, multi-barreled, handled by a wheel. Uh, the problem was, back then, uh, the powder emitted so much smoke that the gunner couldn't see actually what he was shooting at, and there was only a very few marks being employed, so it didn't get really attached to this thing back then. On the right side, you see the French mitrailleuse. Mitrailleuse is still the French word for machine gun. The mitrailleuse back then was a multi barreled unit, uh, which, well, wasn't really perfectly deployed. It was used in the Franco Prussian War, um, but uh, how it was being used was more like a brake shotgun. So, not that, that kind of rapid firing machine gun that we have uh, learned later on. Um, 
so the concepts were there, but there was an effective deployment before the First World War, which was in the colonial wars, during the World Wars, in the Russo Japanese Wars, uh, several years from the Battle of Omdurman against the Sudanese Mahdi. Um, 25,000 British and colonial forces versus 30 to 50,000 Mahdi forces, so one to two roughly. But looking at the casualties, uh, 48 fatalities on the British side, uh, nearly 10,000 on the Sudanese side. Uh, 428 wounded, between 10 and 16,000 on the Mahdi side, of whom most actually died. Yeah. So um, there was this, this nice tune the Maxim gun, about the Maxim gun, which there was then back then employed, which was, whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun, and they have not. Uh, so this Maxim gun was one model, which then later on uh, other machine guns was being developed in the place of that, um, which was utterly effective, but it was effective against colonial adversaries, it was effective in wars far, far away, which didn't really obviously matter too much here in Europe, which was bad. When it comes to gas, well, there was no really use of gas before the First World War. 112,000 tons of poison gas were actually being deployed during the war. Um, what's usually gotten, uh, forgotten is that France used first gas, but not poisonous gas, but tear gas, back in August 1914. Uh, nobody mentioned as in the open field just went away, you know, we saw it was actually being used. It was very effective though in house cleaning, uh, where it was used as well. Um, of course, you all know in, the, in, in May uh, 1915, the first use of chlorine gas in by Germany, a poisonous gas. Uh, so it was actually a weapon which was, which is, and was, uh, very important for the perception of war. But we have a shift when it comes to reality. So, uh, it's first and foremost a terror weapon, but um, the casualties were extremely low in comparison, for example, to artillery. You have a casualty of fatality rate between 0.4 and 0.6%. Uh, it's not really clear to see regarding the Eastern Front. So, when you, when you talk about people's perception of the First World War, it's that nine weapon, but actually it was not. It was actually effective when it comes to surprise. So, the first use at Ypres, at low, they were quite a surprise for the adversary troops or for the own troops as well when it comes to the British application. Uh, when it comes to Cobalit in 1917, for this battle it was very effective as it could get through the Italian gas nests. So the Italian soldiers thought it could protect themselves, but actually it could not. So when it comes to the surprise, gas works very well, it works fantastically well against civilians which don't have gas masks, but uh, otherwise it's rather useless. And it's rather useless also for your own troops, because they have to wear gas masks as well. It's very difficult for them to get into the enemy terrain, um, so it's not really a weapon of choice for many armies. Uh, what's very important also for the perception is the dehumanizing effect of gas masks. So you don't see your own face, your adversary's face, and this is something which really was important for the perception back then and today. What you have as a result from the first quarter is that chemical weapons were banned, but ban is very relative. It's a ban, first of all, as a Western concept. So when it comes to Japan, when it comes to the Iran war, it doesn't really matter about using gas as long as it's an active deployment, um, including Egypt. So. Uh, even more so, um, it's banned, it became banned, uh, only against civilized adversaries. So after the First World War, Churchill said uh, it doesn't really understand this reluctance uh, to deploy gas against uncivilized countries. There's the problem about that. Um, so Italy did, Spain did, the UK fought, the Roots do, they did not. So um, it's a relatively kind of ban. But uh, one of the huge perception, perception errors of uh, the First World War was also the idea of buying fighting. We see it often, lots often in the movies and the, the other ways of, of uh, deploying uh, the war. Uh, fixed violence, important issue, yes. But again, it's more psychological kind of effect. Uh, for your own troops, even more for them. Um, the original use against cavalry was more or less done. Uh, less than 0.2% of the casualties were being done by edge of weapons, 
So again, it's more than 90% artillery. Um, today, still, armies use bayonets for drill, but for much other reasons than for actually killing people, it's more about uh, training aggression. And back then, it was used for the same way, it's still used for the same reason. Uh, most plump, com close combat weapons, however, were quite different. You can see them in lots of museums as these makeshift clubs. We can employ much faster, much quicker, much deadlier than a bayonet, which is fixed on a very long rifle, which could stuck into the enemy body. So actually, it was more the, the short knives, metal dusters, these kind of clubs. Um, tanks. When it comes to tanks, of course, there was this early concept by the ancient and others who always failed due to the lack of motors, transportation. Um, also in science fiction, early 20th century H.G. Wells wrote the Iron, the iron Land, the Iron Land, Iron Class, about future tanks roaming about the countries. Um, and it was quite some weird kind of designs. In 1915, the Russians developed the Tsar of the Netopia uh, with this actually a model of uh, nine meter uh, wheels and diameter, it didn't really work out well. There were other designs which were quite early, an Austrian design uh, by a guy called Bustin, which you can see as a model in the Jedersgeschichtliches Museum in Vienna. The Motorgeschütz from 1911 was actually uh, sporting a revolving turret and should be able to cross trenches. Uh, people, decision making people, didn't really liked the concept, so it was never built. And the same applied to the Ostradamer Panzerwagen. This is the first kind of uh, armored uh, tank, a uh, real tank, in 1904 and developed, and was being presented uh, to Emperor Franz Josef. He allegedly didn't like the idea it was quite a loud kind of machine, and the horses might get in uh, shunned by this. So it was not built again. Um, we all know that tanks were heavily employed in the First World War. The concepts were, however, quite different. For example, France produced, at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the war, nearly 4,000 tanks. Um, Germany, just 20. Having said that, uh, Germany did use tanks. For example, what you see here is not actually a tank factory, that you might think, when you see that picture. It's actually a tank repair shop by the Germans in Charles One. They've applied more than 100 uh, British tanks and French tanks, they could catch it and put the iron cross on it, and here we go to the bottom. So it was seen as a kind of weapon, but um, the, it wasn't an absolute weapon in terms that it could be, that it, that it could employ a massive breakthrough, a decision making breakthrough, but the uh, possibilities against these new weapons were developed as quick again. When it comes to the Air Force, of course, as soon as something is being developed as technology and it can be exploited militarily, it will be done soon. Uh, when you think of the first hot air balloon by Mongolfi in 1783, uh, just 10 years later, the Compagnie d'Aerosphere had been founded by the French, the first military unit to use balloons, less than 10 years later. What you see here on the right is a picture, which is also at the Military Historical Museum in Vienna, from uh, here at the, uh, the Battle of Würzburg in 1796, the picture is from the same year, where France used six balloons and the Austrians could capture one. So this is the first picture of contemporary times of military use of an aerial weapon, so to say. Now looking at the planes of 1904, these fragile kind of things hardly possible to lift the pilot up to the air for a few meters. And 10 years later, we had, at the beginning of the war, already a thousand military planes. Again, back to science fiction, War in the Air by H.G. Wells was an important book for these times. People loved it, read it about future air warfare. We have seen the example of the movie one day later. And the Italo-Turkish War, the Italo-Ottoman War of 1911, 1912, saw the first military action of the Air Force. There was so-called flashettes of Eagle fire in German use, so these metal pieces just dropped down from uh, either the Zeppelin or uh, the plane to people, and if you get hit, not really good. Um, this, I think, it's not, uh, it's, it's 
tended to be an original photo of the uh, Italo-Turkish war. I presume it has been deliberately changed to make it look really good. Uh, it's intended to be uh, a satellite attack in Libya. U-boats, um, which are especially connected with the German warfare. When you see at uh, the early concerts, for example, in the US Civil War, there was already 20, around 20 submarines being fielded, but not really successful. Um, later, oops, sorry, just, just intended to talk about it. Um, at the outset of war, we have just read, uh, heard in Professor Appenthal's interesting presentation about the role of the Hausie Flotte, of the German Navy. It was intended uh, to protect the interest by visible ships. That's the disadvantage of U boats, you don't see them, so you can't use, use them for uh, diplomatic reasons. You can use, him, use them mainly for attack. And uh, so at the beginning of the war, uh, Germany had 24 submarines, of which about 10 were actually being usable. Uh, UK had 78, Italy had more than 30, Russia had the same uh, size of uh, the German uh, U boat fleet. So, at the beginning of the war, the U-boat fleet of the German Navy was quite small, and it was just after the first successes against uh, a few quite old British cruisers that this weapon has been more developed during the war. When it comes to artillery, which actually was responsible for the most fatalities and casualties in the First World War, already 50 years ago, it showed its effectiveness. This is actually a picture by tests made by the Prussian armed forces at the Renaissance fortress of Jülich. So they used their, their most modern crop artillery pieces that more than shot down, shot at the uh, fortress of Jülich, and just a few hours later the fortress could have been taken. As a result of this, uh, in the 1860s, 1870s to 1890s, so many fortresses in Europe were raised were shut down as the effectiveness of modern artillery has already been demonstrated. What really mattered, and um, which usually is not being talked about, is, for example, logistics. By train, later on by cars. Uh, in the US Civil War, in the Franco Prussian War, also in the Russian Russia Japanese War, it was very clear that uh, logistics can be uh, a main factor. The French uh, the, the Prussians managed to uh, show many troops to the Franco-Prussian border. The, in the US Civil War, the uh, lines of the of communication, and especially um, of the trains, were highly contested and were used by especially uh, North American forces. And not least when it comes to, to, the, to again to the Russian-Japanese War, it showed that Russia was not able not, uh, possible, it was not possible for Russia to withstand the whole long, long lines of communication and logistics by uh, the small possibilities for China to have. One important issue is the internal combustion engine. So, uh, it was the internal combustion engine which made possible the development of planes, of tanks, of cars, of submarines, of all these modern kind of weaponry, which then was employed to such an investigating effect. And we must not forget about communication, the telegraph, later on, even the first developments of radio. So this is actually the main factors which change warfare in this respect. And which something is also which is quite forgotten is the hand grenade. The hand grenade is a very long history. It was used in medieval times, even in the antiquity. Um, but it was then forgotten for quite some time. And it was in the Russian Japanese war, again, that it was used by specialists, by combat engineers, against fortifications. During the First World War, Germany alone produced 300 million hand grenades. And uh, on uh, a strong attack day, uh, one division needed 30,000 hand grenades a day. So this was really a new weapon, or a weapon which was an old concept, which we would apply it on a very devastating new scale. So why is that so? That we have this model of um, the totality of the, of the total war, why I was so much surprised about that after all that we have here today. Um, I would like to quote Sir Basil H. Little Hart, who said in Thoughts of War, um, the only thing harder than getting a new idea into a military mind is to get the old one out. 
and uh, some 10 years ago I spoke at a conference about network centric warfare, which was back then quite a new kind of concept developed in the late 90s. And um, there was a German general I was arguing with because he was very proud of his latest uh, network centric warfare demonstration they had in the German forces. And what did they do? They uh, set up the setting of uh, an overwhelming air force attacking a uh, German airport. And as a uh, general, it's very interesting kind of setup, but uh, why does it matter? I mean, do you expect the Luxembourg Air Force attacking us, or the Chinese, or what do you think? Why would we use that? Because back in 2004, uh, the German forces was already, already for three years in Afghanistan, fighting a completely different kind of adversity. And he said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. so you can see that you as a civilian have not the slightest idea about military because um, the attack and the thwarting of an attack by an enemy air force is the most complicated thing you can do. And if you can do that, you can do everything else. And um, I still wouldn't agree, as we tend to fight previous wars. We tend to fight last wars we have experienced, and this was a perfect kind of example. Overwhelming Air Force, this is Cold War thinking, this is the Russians are coming. Uh, so it's maybe not the Russians, so it's maybe mm, so the Russians or the Chinese or somebody else, but this is the way of thinking uh, which is overwhelming in both the military but also in civilian strategic thinking. Um, when it comes to the First World War, there was also a huge lack of contemporary experience. So when it comes to Germany, the last war really fought, except for some colonial strife, was in 1871. When it comes for the British uh, as well, there was, of course, the world wars, there was colonial wars, but it was far, far away. It was colonial wars, come on, the Indians, the Somali, whatever. So there was no uh, symmetric war fighting being done for quite some years. So the one thing which adds to this, uh, we have seen that during the American Civil War, during, especially during the, the Russo-Japanese Wars, uh, there was more than more fighting applied, which led to what we have seen in the First World War. But this was other powers. This was the patients, for God's sake. Um, <laughs> so we, we don't really look at these kinds of experiences, at least not back then, I presume, hmm, not really today too, as it's, uh, it's not us, it's others, and they do things differently. Um, we must also not forget about the influence of public opinion, especially during the later stage of the First World War when there was hardly any option to say, okay, let's now stop it. As all the peoples wanted to continue to a certain extent by saying, well, we have put so much effort in it, there was so many losses now, it must be for a reason, not just for going back to the status quo ante. In general terms, I would say, um, if technology is available and usable for the military, it will prevail. Um, having said that, and respective countermeasures. So the, the history of technology development, we have these important factors of technology, of breakthrough, of radar, of the planes, etc. There's only a few years, sometimes just a few months, where this technology is countered, is thwarted by a counter technology. Um, and uh, when it comes to the, uh, the development of technology, why well, it's getting so quick, or sometimes not, it's dependent on so many other social, economic, social, cultural factors. Um, where is it? Um, this kind of smartphone. Everybody more or less has it today. I remember that 20 years ago, when I made my vocational education as a photographer, I was selling mobile phones. And it was the size of a brick, about as heavy as a brick, and you could just film with them. Crazy for a phone. Um, today we have more or less, as it being said, the knowledge of the world in our hands. We can do everything with them, just for maybe a quick and copy. Uh, this is 20 years time and our communication has changed. Less so for us, but we still may use the phone for phoning, but looking at the younger generation, they completely, they completely differently communicate with each other. Um, technology, however, is not enough. So you need to develop concepts, you need to develop methods, you need to develop training to apply them correctly. So the history of warfare and the history of technology within warfare is filled with examples that uh, technology is being developed, but not used properly. We have seen it with the machine gun, especially the French mitrailleuse. We could later on see it with the development of the tank, 
which is proved during the whole First World War that it was quite an effective weapon, but during the Second World War it was not used by the French, for example, as an effective weapon, that is, mobile artillery, whereas the Germans much more understood the concept of mobile warfare after they read the books of Fuller and Little Hart. Let's always hope, uh, although a cynicon, I would like to quote Alfred Nobel, who wrote to Bertha von Suttner in 1891, perhaps my factories will put an end to war sooner than your congresses on the day that two army corps can mutually annihilate each other in a second. All civilized nations will surely recoil with horror and disband their troops. Well, we have seen these days happening, that these things could happen. Uh, this guy called Gatlin, who developed this Gatlin gun, also thought that his invention would stop war, as now there were so devastating firepower, so this will be the end. We all know it is not. But well, people from the First World War suffered, and I would say which we're still suffering today, especially the cinema makers, is uh, what in management terms is called the Pippi Longstocking syndrome. So Pippi Longstocking, this is girl, yeah. Likes to make his own Shaharan worlds according to her likings. And this is something I've experienced in management lots that the managers tend to make their own perfect worlds, and according to this perfect world, this decision is the perfect decision because it leads to that. And especially this kind of decision making processes we have seen in the First World War, as that uh, we all tried to have the ideal world, but it was not. So, Maybe as a kind of positive ending, I'll give the happy end of the airship destroy. So, huge destruction being done by the airships. <coughs> Our hero, which has been turned down by his lock, by his girlfriend, uh, is saving her. Actually, his competitor is not so lucky, but fair enough. He's still trying to save him. the whole destruction of the whole city and a very early concept of special effects. <laughs> and what we see next is quite interesting, as our inventor, uh, after failing with his plane, which I haven't shown you, he crashed with his plane as a bird, has another invention, um, and it's a drone. And this leads us directly to the time 100 years later. Hmm. It's an unmanned aerial vehicle, It's a British one. British. And there we go. So this is the end of the Zeppelin, and obviously of all the rest of the huge invasion force. And uh, our hero gets his girl, and the story, and he's happy. And with this, I would like to thank for your attention. There was actually hope some 101 years ago, <coughs> when at least at the Western Front, uh, enemy soldiers thought it was actually already enough for fighting wars. And for a few days, they had the so called Christmas tours. Um, the commanding officers, I don't know why it's on the I mean, the commanding officers didn't really like the idea, and it was forbidden for the next occasions. The war ever continued for more for bloody years. Mm -hmm. We all know what your stories. So, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions later.